Good evening and welcome to the Village of Westmont Committee of the Whole Meeting for December 15th, 2011. I'd like to begin by having our, our village clerk take the roll call, please. Mayor Ron. Here. The clerk's here. Trustee Emery. Here. Trustee Fleming. Here. Trustee Clevenow. Here. Trustee Nero is absent. Trustee Scott. Here. Trustee Seneca is absent. Manager Searle. Here. Attorney Perez. Here. Police Chief Mulhern. Here. Deputy Police Chief Gunter. Here. Human Resource Director Casey. Here. Finance Director Parker. Here. Community Development Director Malik. No, she's here. She, she went downstairs to get something for the computer. Oh, and uh, wait she's a minute. Here. Our Public Works Director May is here, too. What's <laughs> that? You please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. First item before us this evening are the minutes of the December 1st Committee of the Whole Meeting and December 5th Village Board Meeting. Any corrections to be reported to the clerk at this time? Hearing none, <clears throat> moving right along. We have two open forum requests before us this evening. And first, I would like to call up to the podium uh, Rebecca Scheibel from 305 Fordham Way. <clears throat> Hello. My name is Rebecca Scabel. My husband and I moved to Westmont in January, and we live in the Ashford subdivision. A few weeks ago, all the residents of the Ashford subdivision received a notice from the village that the emerald ash borer was discovered, um, and that all of the ash trees along the parkways are to be removed. All ash trees destined for removal are marked with a large white dot, and it is shocking to see the tremendous number of trees that will be um, removed in our neighborhood. According to the village arborist, 80% of our parkway trees are ash trees. In total, about 350 trees will be removed from our subdivision. These trees were all planted by the developers when the subdivision was built in the mid-1980s. So these are mature trees averaging uh, about 16 to 18 inches in diameter. The removal of these trees will be devastating to our neighborhood. The residents of Ashford are very concerned about how the removal of these hundreds of trees will impact the character of our, of our neighborhood as well as our property values. Tree removal is supposed to start this week, but there is no schedule to, for replanting due to a lack of funds. As a resident of Ashford, I'm very concerned, and I understand the threat of the emerald ash borer, but I want to ask first if there's any other way of dealing with this besides cutting down all the trees. For example, I've read that in some villages, um, residents are allowed to treat the trees at their own expense instead of cutting them down. So I just want to ask if there's any other possible method for dealing with this besides cutting down the trees. Secondly, if there's nothing that can be done to save the trees, how can we work with the village of Westmont to see that new healthy trees of diverse species are planted as soon as possible? I understand that the village of Westmont does not currently have funds set aside for replanting trees, but I hope that together we can find a way to get as many new trees as possible planted this year. Um, to in, in order to uh, begin restoring the urban forest in the Ashford subdivision. Thank you. Thank you. If I may, I'd like to ask our public works director, Steve May, to come forth and give us a little more background on the ash situation. Sure. Um, well, everything that was presented was, was very accurate, the, you know, the quantities and the extent of the devastation. The, uh, we're also in attendance at the Public Works Committee last Tuesday evening, and we had this similar discussion, and that's where we talked about the difficulties with the, um, the inequity between the budgeted for the replacement and the, the extent of the, uh, of the problem that we have. As you're all aware, we've started in, uh, two years ago, we, we located it in Oakwood subdivision and started doing the removal in a radius around those fines, and in Oakwood, last winter, and I, and I guess speaking to that, we know we have the, you know, inevitably have the village-wide issue. So every winter, and for public works, it's the best time for us to do the proactive removal 
and catch up on that type of work because it is the time of season when if you're not doing any type of snow and ice control, it's the best time to do all of the forestry, whether it's pruning or, or this type of work. So just on our end, we concentrate the work uh, you know, in the winter months. The, so two winters ago, or well, I should say last winter, we, we did the Ashford subdivision and I removed just a little over 200 trees. And that was just in the radius that we did it for those of you familiar with the area, that's about a third of the way up into, you know, the Oakwood subdivision. And we were, would have gone back into there this winter and done a bigger radius, except that during the windstorms we had over the spring, we, there were many of the down trees in um, Ashford that we, we could see the extent of the infestation. It was very obvious and it was, and it's significantly more severe. So, We've moved our attention to the Ashford subdivision. It is true that there are over 350 trees that are marked. I, it's not likely that we'll get that far through this winter. I mean, it's possible, but there's a good chance we won't. That's just the extent of what we found in that subdivision. And as far as treatment, it's, it's beyond, um, if you were gonna do any type of chemical treatment, not that we've found anyone that we're supportive of, but even if you were work to, that's all preventative and it has to be in the, system of the tree before the emerald ash borer ever shows up. So there was, um, I believe Indian Trails uh, pulled the permit some time ago to do proactive chemical treatment at their expense uh, in that development. And with the understanding that, you know, if, if and when it fails, you know, we will still be doing the removal, but they're trying to prolong it uh, as much as possible. I have no idea what that's worth. That is something they were doing it. Well, I should say they, took the permit out. I really have no idea if they proceeded with the application, but I know they wanted to treat the trees, the private trees in their development, so they, they probably did uh, proceed, but I can't be sure. So the question or the, or the, 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 the request is, is, is all part of the budget processes to, you know, asking that uh, we all give the, as much attention as possible and afford as much funds to try and catch up with the tree replanting, at, at, at least in the same rate with the removal that we're doing, because we're, if we do everything in Ashford that's marked this year, we'll be approximately 500 public parkway trees behind replanting schedule. So it's a function of budgeted availability and we have, we can't commit to um, any replacement because the, we don't have the funds for that replacement. So it's hard to say how many will be afforded until we get until uh, you know, the next fiscal year, we won't know what will be allotted in that year. One thing we were working on at the meeting was putting together a you know, cost participation policy where maybe with um, the participation would be if the, the resident or the, the applicant uh, absorbed the cost of purchasing the tree, we would still make the purchase. It would be at our cost. We would still go through the consortium and, and uh, purchase the tree. We would also do the installation. And, and, it, and when it's all done, it'll still be a public parkway tree, but the cost would be in the cost of the materials, and then that way there's not a, an adverse effect on the budget. So that is something uh, we started to work on at uh, last Tuesday at the last meeting. Uh, the task was to come up with a, you know, our best recommendation for a formal policy, and that will be discussed at the January Public Works Committee meeting. So unless there's any other questions, that's where we're at in Public Works. What's the approximate cost of a tree? The, we've calculated the average tree, um, I'll elaborate on that a little bit. The, one of the reasons we want control over the planning too, well, firstly, why is there, why, I don't know what you said the percent was, but why are 80% of any one species planted in any one subdivision? And at the time it was developed, that was permitted, uh, diversity is uh, expected now and required by code. But at the time, there, there wasn't. You can go all the way back to like Dutch elm disease, you know, and you'll, you'll see the same impact. So um, either Ashford was named because that was the most available tree they had for planting, or it was named first and they picked ash trees to do it. But we were, we have a, we want to diversify the stock. So the, the program now is different trees, different types of trees have different value and depending on the caliper. So we've calculated our average for all of our tree programs going back in the years to be about $220 per tree for a two and a half inch caliper tree. And we would, our expectation would be to charge the same rate despite which species gets planted in the parkway, just so that it's uniform. 
When the arborist was out there, did they also look at how many ash trees were not on the public parkway but in the private parts so we know if we've got incubators for emerald ash borer just sitting over there on private property? Well, we have not done an inventory. In fact, we don't have, right now our own public inventory is, is in process of being done. So when you, you saw, well, it might have been be previous to when you were on the board, but John did go around and kind of just with a marker on an address map, just driving down the street with someone identified all the trees. So we do have a map that shows them on public and private. They're not counted and it's just, the diameters aren't there. It's just a representation of what it looks like village wide. And by the end of this month, well, I shouldn't say this month, within the next month, we will ha have our inventory, our tree inventory, and we'll know exactly how many ash, how many public owned ash trees there are and then you can more than double that to include private trees. But I don't have a, a good number yet. Okay, thanks. Well, that's where we're at. And, uh, I, I second the request for, hopefully we can afford as much funding attention so to you, it. Didn't we used to be able to get grants to replace trees? We actually have a grant um, that was recently applied for and we just uh, were awarded a $10,000 uh, matching grant and that will, you'll see that line item in the proposed budget, but that still is 80 trees. And the 40 that were afforded in the last budget, so it, we, if we want to accept the grant, we'll have to plant 80 trees, but it, it's still a fraction of what, what the issue is. But we look for all those opportunities and apply for all of them. The inventory is being paid for with a grant. So it'll be up to the board to make the final decision as to how much money can be put aside for purchase of as additional of the, trees yeah, to replace the, those. And so far as the entire budget process. As far right? as our investment right. goes, but we're, we are working on this cost, cost sharing right. option as well. Right. We'll discuss. So it's, it's something that we're well aware of. Uh, Parkway trees have been a priority item for me for many, many years, and we yes. we used to have a very, very large replacement program. And unfortunately, due to budget constraints, we've had to drop that way back, but we'd certainly all like to see that jump way up, so we will do everything that we can to move forward to replace as many of those trees as we are able. And on the um, replacement project, I you know like Buffalo Grove just by ordinance forbid replanting of any ash trees so that they don't perpetuate any of this. Right, we would, exactly, we would not consider it. But you know, some people might want to do it on their own and we don't know about it and if they replant ash trees, they're just putting out. That's true, but there are, there are the Forestry industry is very well aware of this issue, and I really doubt that there's anything new being grown uh, to accommodate that. So, it'll, it'll, right. you know, maybe 20 years from now they can reintroduce, you know, the species, but or they'll have a a tolerant ash species that will be available. Yep. Okay. Any more comments from board members? <laughs> yes. If you'd uh, step up to the podium and give us your uh, name and address, please. My name is uh, my name is Barbara Lapointe, and I read a lot. And I read in an entomology magazine that there's an insect out that will kill the ash borer. And I don't know anything about it, the name or anything, but it might be something to consider in the future, bringing in this insect to uh, kill the ash borer. We did that with um, ladybugs to kill the aphids, and now we're surrounded with oriental ladybugs, but they're not harming anything. Okay. So that's all I have to say. I, I do know an entomologist out in California that I could probably t uh, talk to if you're interested. So that's it. How do you give that name to our public works director, Steve May, so the that he has The entomologist's name? 
Yes, whatever information okay. you have. I don't have it with me, but I, okay. can, get, just, I can give it to that, you. I read an article today, and it was a Chinese wasp. It's not, obviously, that's not hmm. the yeah, technical it's, name, it's, but that's what they were calling it. That, okay. that some villages are using this Chinese wasp to eat the emerald ash borer, but the results are not consistent. Well, maybe you read the same article I did, but I, I can uh, give the... Uh, I appreciate the information. I'll, I'll just quickly add that you, you brought that up last meeting. Yes, and, I uh, did. And the Forester is familiar with what you're talking about, and I, I can't explain the details here tonight, but it was already an option that he had ruled out as far as where we're at already with our yeah. infestation. So. Well, I'm a tree Still, hugger, well, you know, and whatever I can do all. to save a tree. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, next, I'd like to call um, Bruce Barker forward from Holy Trinity Church and Adam Smorakowski. Smorakowski, yes. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, board of trustees, uh, uh, village staff, and viewers. My name is Adam Smorakowski, and this is Bruce Barker. We're from Holy Trinity uh, Church here in town. Uh, this evening, uh, what we'd like to do, our goal was to introduce our new pastor, Father Michael Danik, and his two associates, Father Marian Vrablewski and uh, Father Gerald Watt. Uh, they come to us uh, from uh, the Diocese of Joliet, had put together an agreement with the Resurrection uh, Order out of Chicago to uh, come and uh, uh, look over our parish. And uh, we're actually extremely excited about that. They are some of the nicest priests and people that you can meet. Their focus of the resurrection priests, and I personally know a little bit about them because I grew up with that order. Uh, they were my uh, teachers uh, in, uh, uh, at St. Hyacinth's Parish in Logan Square area in Chicago. And there were also my teachers at Gordon Tech High School. Uh, so uh, their focus is on education and on uh, community interaction. And they've actually done a pretty good job of that. Uh, so uh, our goal was to have Father Michael actually say all this to you. Uh, but the emergency came up and he got called away about four o'clock this afternoon. And, we're hoping he was going to be here, but as it is, we have Bruce and myself. And, uh, okay. So he does apologize for that. The second string. Second okay. string, yes. Uh, as uh, uh, on behalf of Father, uh, what he'd like us to say is, uh, first of all, to invite everybody over this coming holiday season to our parish. We have a whole lot of various activities going to be going on there, whether you're a member of Holy Trinity or not. Uh, we, he welcomes everybody for any of the events uh, that are going to be taking place. And uh, again, community interaction is one of his strengths. So if you haven't had a chance to meet him, uh, hopefully either stop by and you will, or you will have the opportunity in the future. He'd love to talk to you. And, uh, the other thing Father would like us to, to mention to the board today is in the short order that he's been here, he realizes that our parish center that we've been working on for quite a while is something that's extremely important to the, not only to Holy Trinity, but also to the community. Uh, so he's very excited about that. And Bruce and myself being uh, members of the Heritage of Faith Committee, which actually has been working on this center for quite some time, uh, he's, uh, he's basically telling us, well, let's, let's move along. Let's get this thing going. Uh, so that's exactly what we're doing. And what he wants to ask the board and the village is for their continual support in our process and our progress of doing this. You guys have been supportive in the past, and he'd like to just uh, extend that courtesy to, uh, uh, as we move forward. Uh, in that process, we do have the architects of SDR of Chicago as our architects continuing to uh, help us design the project. 
we're even in the process of uh, building a model, if I don't want it, a model built uh, so the community can physically see it. Architectural technology today, everything is more automated on computers and fancy stuff like that, uh, which does create uh, some, you know, it's a, it's a, it allows technology to build the building better. Uh, but Father also believes that the people in the community want to physically see and touch the, this new building that we're going to try to do. So we're going to start that process uh, next week, actually, hopefully in next uh, month have that done. Uh, as a part uh, of uh, uh, building a parish center, we're going to be increasing our fundraising process to raise the money necessary to build this building. And that's always a challenge, especially in today's economy, but nothing's ever stopped us before. As you can see in our parish, we have built and rebuilt many of our buildings there. And the parish center is the next phase of a well-defined uh, multi-project plan for the whole center, for the whole... If I could just jump in here once. Uh, it's probably go kind of gone unnoticed, but since 1992, when the church went up on the corner, outside of paying our operating expenses, we've been able to do almost $9 million worth of work to our buildings. So we're here to say that our buildings are in really good shape. We're just missing one, and we've been missing one since the inception of the parish back in 1950. All right. Well, actually, 1938. No, but they tried to build that in 1950. And uh, here we are again, still trying to build that. All right. And the center is intended not only for all the various uses of our church and our school, but also of the community. We have some plans for that. Uh, part of the fundraising that we're initiating is uh, a, a series of Christian uh, concerts that are going to start actually in January 10th and keep on going, uh, we're not sure exactly how often, but probably a couple times a year forever, hopefully. The first one being uh, on January 10th of Audrey Assad, and I believe Bruce pass, is passing out the, the flyer for that. We're inviting everybody to, okay. We're inviting everybody to come to this. This is actually going to be at the Tivoli in Downers Grove. Uh, we're expecting to hold about 1,000 people, or it holds about, I think, about 900 comfortably. So uh, please come. She's a very well-known, up-and-coming young artist that actually has a recording out there. Uh, she'll be accompanied, or uh, Larry Lalonde, our music director, and his group will also perform uh, some lovely music before you know she starts and so we're very excited having her we're actually flying her in from somewhere to uh, to do this and inviting everybody to come to that uh, let me add something sure you no know, we're very glad to have this event at the Tivoli theater in Downers Grove but when we get this parish center accomplished we'll be able to have that right here in Westmont at our parish where we want that we'll have a facility that we'll be able to hold Hold, um, we're hoping 600 to 800 people auditorium style and have an event like this that you know brings people to our community right and that takes them what I have shown now is the architectural conceptual drawings of the Paris Center as we see it now it'll be fine-tuned once we get more details and bring that to the board uh, but conceptually you have to show something to the parishioners of what do we think this thing's going to look like so that's what it's going to look like uh, you can get more details on this hopefully let's see let's see that somewhere yeah all right there's a web page right at the bottom of this brochure which gives you more information as well as you can purchase tickets directly on there or just show up on january 10th we'll take tickets right at the door too uh, Again, we thank you very much for the time to be able to uh, uh, tell you a little more about uh, where we are at Holy Trinity and introduce Father, and hopefully in the near future, every one of you can meet Father Danik. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. For your information. <clears throat> can I ask what time the concert is? 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. Thank you. Doors will open at 6.30. Yeah, it doesn't say the time on the end. Okay, reports moving right along. Uh, <clears throat> Mayor, the only thing I would like to do, I'm 
believe this is our last meeting before Christmas. Is that correct? Monday. Monday. Yeah. Monday. Well, after Monday. But I did want to, um, for those people that may not be watching us on Monday, to extend a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to uh, everybody here and all the residents and those watching us on, on TV this evening. And a Happy New Year. And as I've said time and time again, let's all remember to, to uh, shop and dine and discover Westmont. Um, all of our businesses need our support, and without our support, they're not going to, they're not going to make it. So as you finish up your last minute Christmas shopping or go out for dinner, please try to support our restaurants and our businesses here in the village of Westmont. Uh, thank you. And the only other thing I'd like to request is a executive session regarding personnel and pending litigation. Thank you. Next, our village clerk. I just want to compliment the uh, chamber on their fine <coughs> Friday night. We were, all of us were there. We all had a good time. I had a good time. <laughs> I spent Jerry's money. I always have a good time if I spent Jerry's money. Um, I also went to the um, high school concert last Wednesday night, a week ago Wednesday night, with the vocal and the bands. It was outstanding. That will put you in the mood for Christmas, if anything. It was a great concert, great time. Um, and our Rotary group had the combo from the high school. So I've had a lot of music, good music. So, um, and I'm sorry, um, Tracy had her open house Tuesday night, and Steve, I apologize, I forgot about the public works meeting. So, sorry, I would have been there. <laughs> Other than that, that's all I have tonight. Okay. Thank you. Next, our uh, village attorney, Anne Marie. I don't have any report for tonight, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Our village manager, Ron Searle. Thank you. The only thing I had is I wanted to invite uh, uh, Police Chief Tom Mulhern to the podium. Uh, he would like to make an announcement regarding our uh, tow contract. Uh, this is not something that requires board action, but as information, um, he asked if he could have just a few minutes to uh, comment on that this evening. Thank you, Mayor Searle. Um, as you know, um, I believe it was two years ago, uh, we began entering into contact, contracts or agreements with uh, various tow companies to perform police-directed tows. Police-directed tows would be a vehicle that's involved in arrest, also vehicles that are involved in accidents, may be stalled. Uh, we come across someone that needs a tow or a tire changed. Uh, companies that we call, and we, in this way we can also uh, monitor and control their actions and their response. Every year, um, beginning around October, November, we conduct a review. We open for um, uh, applications from local tow companies or any tow company interested, provided they meet our requirements. This year we had 11 applications that my staff reviewed and made me a recommendation. Based on their recommendation and review of the 11 applications, we're awarding four agreements to uh, four uh, tow companies in the area. And those four companies are Chariot Towing, Action Towing, O'Hare Towing, and Westmont Shell. Uh, we increased this from three to four for this year. Uh, the three Action, Chariot, and O'Hare were the uh, towing companies that we have used consistently last year. And uh, Chariot Towing is one that we have used for a long time. We've had an agreement, we've been using their services, I wanna say in excess of five years. Uh, tomorrow I will be, uh, my, uh, Sergeant Gruen from my staff will be meeting with the owners, executing the agreements, but we just wanted to publicly announce um, the four recipients of the uh, agreements for the next year's police directed tows. These agreements are only for one year and uh, they are reviewed every year and uh, so each company is encouraged to re continue to apply each and every year and we make the review. I'm open for any questions you may have. You do like a background check on the company? Yes, Mayor, we do. Um, we check with the state police, we check with local communities to see if any other towns have experienced problems. We also keep track, uh, we have certain requirements they um, must uh, comply with. Uh, of most importance is that they must respond to a call for within 30 minutes of the time we place the call. They must be on scene with 30 minutes. If they don't, we, we monitor that and watch that. 
I'm pleased to say that all three companies that we used this past year, the only day they were late was on the uh, blizzard in February, um, and that I gave them uh, special dispensation for because no one was able to get around in that weather. Um, but uh, other than that, yes, we do a background, we check with other uh, communities and see what type of service they provide. That is part of the review that Sergeant Gruen uh, conducts. Uh, Chief, um, being the four of them, are they on a rotation basis? Yes, it's uh, they go down the list, so it's one one out of every four tolls that they will get. Okay, um, so every so time there's a toll, then they go to the next toll goes to the next one down the list. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, do they have all? Do they have their own place they store the cars? Yes, that's part of the requirements. They have, to re they have a, a, a geographical location requirement within they must have a storage yard within a certain location of Westmont. Um, their offices must be within a certain location of Westmont, um, and the uh, re the storage um, requirements. Some some are required to have indoor outdoor storage facilities. Um, we are uh, contracting, I believe, with. One company to perform its relocator services. Basically, if you know we need to have a car relocated uh, in the middle of the winter, snow, uh, the winter plowing, um, a car may be parked uh, obstructing uh, plows. We try not to tow cars, but as a very last resort, we would relocate it, and that's you have to have a relocator license to do so. They come and just relocate the vehicle to another location. Uh, one other of note two is O'Hare towing. Uh, we had the opportunity of using them this year. They have a dive team. We had a car go into a pond. Normally we have to call the fire department, the fire department dive team to go out, check for you know signs of life in the vehicle, number one, but after that, to go and help us recover the vehicle from the pond. We no longer will have to do that because O'Hare Towing has a dive team, which we used uh, this last year. They put their divers in and they recover the vehicle from the water themselves, thus uh, alleviating the fire department had to be on scene. Um, how far away are there towing areas that residents would have to go to? Do you have an, I mean, is there, what's your parameter idea? Is it five, 10 miles? Sorry about that. No, I read everything else but. <laughs> um, I want to say 25 miles, oh, here we go. Um, outside storage for each uh, towing operator will store a vehicle at approved locations of their choice. The inventory will be within the village limits or no more than 10 miles outside the village limits of Westmont. Okay, so the furthest somebody would have to go is 10 miles. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. And two changes we're making also is that um, we're going to allow them to change their fee structure. Again, we can control what they charge. Um, <coughs> a lot of companies will uh, release a vehicle after hours. Um, and some companies have asked, one company asked to allow to charge an additional fee to have to come back to the business to release a vehicle after hours. I agree that only under the condition that they must tell the person that this is an extra fee because they're coming for after hours only. Um, so that way, okay, if I knew that I was gonna get charged an extra $25, I may let it go till Monday and save myself the $25. So they're gonna be required that if someone wants to come after hours, they're gonna be charged a $25 fee, but they're gonna be told that that fee is just because they're coming after hours. If they wait, they won't pay that. Now they're after hours, is it including weekends are considered after hours? Uh, some, uh, yes, I believe on uh, Saturdays, it's from like eight, uh, one company was from eight till one. Um, some don't run 24 seven operations. Um, most of them are closed on Sundays. So they usually don't come back on Sundays, but we're finding that a lot like to come back because they want to get the car off their property because it allows space for more inventory to come in. And these are going to be called up by our the dispatch? Village Operations Center, yes, the VOC. Okay, the dispatch will call them. Yes. So is there any conflict of any of these because our dispatch now is in Downers? No, we've been using three of them for the last year, and uh, Westmont Towing will be added for this year. Um, it's, it's just the same. They contain the list. They have a list over there. We talked about consolidating our list with Downers Grove's list, but I wanted to stay separate. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any questions? Does that have to do with private parking lots? Like behind, uh, I have an apartment building with a, uh, and I have a contract with Chariot. The question is for those who can't hear, a member of the audience asked, what about private property? She has a contract with Chariot uh, for an apartment complex or an apartment building in private property. No, we cannot tow from private property. Okay. Um, so you need to have that contract with your tow company of choice. They have to post a sign, and that's why you'll see these are private property. You know, um, AAA towing, um, Chariot. Yes. 
Um, no, you stay with them. We do not, can't, we cannot uh, author, we, if, if someone were to request a toll that's not part of this, we can, you know, call a toll for you independently, but for your private property, you need to have an agreement with a vendor of your choice. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Moving right along, trustee items. Uh, start with trustee seven out. Uh, just a couple of items here. Um, for one is uh, Monday at 6.30 here in the boardroom, we have a building and zoning committee and code enforcement committee meetings, joint meetings here at 6.30 right here. And on a little personal note, um, there had been something in the newspaper um, and I guess some publicity about the tollway that they had been some kind of goof up on their charges on your accounts that um, the, the uh, I-Pass had been charging and goofing around. And so I, I didn't even, I don't read the paper, so, and my husband never mentioned it. So I happened to hear it Monday at a party, and so I had him go in and to see. And of course, it just showed that October they had, you know, we dropped down, they took our $40. But I got suspicious because for October, barely using it, it dropped down to 23 so we went into the usage, and this is what I would like everybody who has this uh, transponder, the IPASS transponder, go into the usage because my usage showed that October 31st, I was on the Indiana Toll Road in South Bend, and there was a $19.54 charge on my I, you know, my IPASS. So, so we're disputing it right now, you know, but they go, well, we have to call Indiana, I really don't care. I wish it was like the charge card. When you dispute, they say, we'll take it off for now. And if we find it was you, but they don't do that. You know, we've got some person. So I'm just kind of trying to warn the residents and anybody who may have an IPASS, you know, don't just look at what's been charged on your charge card. You might want to start looking at the history. Uh, we went back for a year, and this is the only erroneous one that we could see. And hopefully we're going to get it settled. But... Uh, you know, it, it will hit, and I suppose people say, you know, things can happen, but uh, the toll road is about ready to almost double its fees starting January 1st, so I'm not really happy when I saw this, knowing that they're going to double it, and if people never heard of it, I went in and see a 40 cent charge is now going to be 75 cents, so if you pay cash, your 40 cents was 80, so multiply that times 75 it's what a dollar 50 I mean they're they're going to be coming up with a lot of money and I don't like the idea of how this is happening um, there was no there wasn't even a license plate on there and I think that should be something I'm going to try to talk with Patty Bellock or somebody and see if they can't force any state there are 11 states that you can take your IPAS in we went and looked at the map thing so I think anything if we're going to be if any resident is charged an out of state toll it should show the license plate and I'm going to see if Patty or somebody can can try to get IDOT to do that, so it can follow through a little better, and maybe it'll uh, answers will happen faster. But for now, I just I don't want to panic anybody, but feel free to go back in and go under history usage for each of your transponders and see if anybody was erroneously charged. I think it would help. And outside of that, I would just like to wish everybody a very very merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Scott. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. I'd like to uh, give everybody an update on uh, longtime resident Roger Westman. He's on uh, going on 100 days in the hospital, and he's not doing well. Oh. So anything we can do to kind of cheer him up, whether it's visits or cards. Um, I was on Facebook the other night and trying to advise the, uh, asking the residents if they would send a card to his residence if they know where he lives. I won't give that address out over the, uh, over the uh, air. Um, or to the Chamber of Commerce or even uh, mail it to, in care of me here and I'll give them to uh, his wife Nancy but um, we should all keep him in, in our prayers right now because uh, he's not doing Can too well. Can you tell us what how, how He's at Heinz Hospital. At Heinz Hospital. Yeah. Oh, okay. And you really got to when you get there you got to find out because he's bouncing around between uh, intensive care and rehab. Okay. Okay. So that and uh, everybody have a good Christmas and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Trustee Emery. Uh, just a couple things. I also went to the holiday concert up at the um, high school to see uh, the lovely Miss uh, Bella from Brazil play her guitar and the lovely Miss Sabrina Scott playing. And, you know, it's funny because I'll tell you, some of that stuff, you just listen to it and you forget their kids. There's so much talent up there. 
and um, also the Westmont Winter Ball. That was a blast. It's, it's put on by the chamber, and it would be nice to see um, re a lot more residents, uh, you know, uh, come next year and not think that it's just, you know, for the chamber members and all that. Um, the highlight was the auctioning off of Chief uh, Frank Trout who, uh, in order to drive the bids up, started taking off his clothes. So I really recommend that people people start to uh, show up at that ball because it's, it's a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Um, and wish everybody, uh, of course, happy holidays. And that's all I have tonight. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Fleming. Well, everyone's pretty well said it, so I have nothing <laughs> this evening. Thank you. Not even Merry Christmas? Our, I, can say Merry, um, I can say Merry Christmas. <laughs> our local performing arts group is giving a performance before Christmas, and I do not have the details. If anyone has the details on that, uh, I, I would thought like it was Saturday. It's Saturday, this Saturday, and the performances are at 3 and 5 p.m. It yeah, was last Miracle Saturday, on 34th right? Street. No, it's this yeah. Saturday. No, no, it's, it's the, this, this Saturday. 17th. This Saturday. Saturday. Well, the 17th. The 17th. Okay. I thought it was the 9th. And it, they will be held at the Westmont. Senior Center. Senior, Senior Center. Center, yeah. So it, it is indeed a, a great group, and I'm surprised there isn't someone here from that group this uh, evening to uh, announce that one last time. But uh, if you can attend one of their presentations, and we all enjoyed their last presentation. They're doing a great job, and we want to do all we can to encourage, uh, encourage them to continue their activities. Thank you. Unfinished business. Single family residential rental licensing ordinance board to discuss preparation of an ordinance that would license all single family residential rental units. Just one, need one moment to get the uh, PowerPoint Sorry, this is a different version than I'm used to. The window thing down. Just Usually it's it down there. You see the bell, yeah, you know, there's usually a window here that you yeah. click and it makes it go full screen. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, tonight, I'm presenting some information along with uh, Spencer Parker uh, regarding the board's direction to look into the opportunity to expand our current multifamily rental licensing program. Uh, it was based on some of the feedback that began at the September 19th Committee of the Whole meeting uh, where staff was asked to research some of the legal and um, staffing issues that could come up if the program were to be expanded. And of course, the goal of the program uh, that we have in place right now for multifamily residential uh, rental unit licensing is to ensure that basic life safety measures and quality of life are met for the residents in those units. What I'm gonna do is first describe a little bit about where we're at today and then talk uh, a little bit about what would occur if the program were to be expanded to include single family rental licensing. Uh, the current multifamily dwelling licensing program was adopted in August of 2009, and it went into effect in January of 2010. So at this point in time, we're at, at the process um, right now of entering our third licensing cycle. So we've had a few years to kind of see how this operates for the multifamily program. And again, this was initiated uh, at the very beginning um, for life safety and um, quality of life matters so that those minimum qualities were met. 
some of the trends that we are witnessing, at least at the staff level, uh, and most of these are due to economic conditions being what they are today, are an increased number of foreclosures. This frequently will bring a decrease in the number of owner-occupied units. For, this is all single family. Um, Bank-owned and out-of-state landlords, decrease in teardowns, and then deferred maintenance. So in order to, um, to maintain and then improve the housing stock within the village, um, it might be advantageous to consider expanding the single family, the rental program to include single family homes. Within the village of Westmont at this time, we have 3,733 multifamily dwelling units. Um, the program has three aspects to it. The first is the rental licensing component for the landlord. The second is a crime-free lease addendum for the tenant. And the third is uh, exterior and interior inspections that are based off of a checklist of property maintenance and building codes. Um, the number of inspections that we've completed this calendar year from January 1st through the end of November has been 1,105. And just as a point of reference, um, for all first-time inspections, we approximate that about 95% of all first-time inspections require at least one reinspection and then sometimes several follow-up reinspections. Now, if the single family component were added to our rental licensing program, um, that would add about 800 units. The program would be approximately the same, so there would be the rental uh, landlord rental license component, there would be the crime-free lease addendum, and there would be exterior and interior inspections, but the differences here are that there are no common area inspections and that each licensed unit would be inspected as opposed to the 10% goal for the entire population of uh, the rental multifamily units. So if, if the program were to be combined, uh, we would anticipate that we would be at least doubling the number of inspections that would be performed by staff. Uh, there are several suggestions if, if the board decides to go in this direction uh, in order to make it so that the uh, fee structure and then the staffing levels can make, make the program work. Um, first is the multifamily licensing fee uh, is currently $30. We would recommend increasing that to $40. And in a moment, I'll go over um, some additional information on a survey that was done of some other communities within the area that have similar programs so that you can see where that number falls in line. Um, and then for single family licensing, the new portion of the program, uh, it would be suggested that that fee be $75 per house. Um, by, by combining the program, we would also uh, improve some administrative efficiencies and reprioritize some of our resources uh, and suggest adding one part-time administrative assistant and one full-time equivalent inspector. Um, I did pass around the dais a sheet that uh, spreadsheet this evening, and that summarizes some of the results of our discussions with, I believe it was six different municipalities. Um, five are shown here because they were most similar to the fee structure that we have in place here. So you can see for the multifamily licenses for the communities that have that in place, um, the fee way ranges between 30 and $50. Uh, currently, again, the village of Westmont is at 30, and we would propose a $40 fee. Um, many of the communities that we talked to also stated that they have a mechanism in place to annually review the fees uh, to determine whether or not they're still adequate. Uh, then for the single family component, you can see that some of the other communities, um, they're, they're charging between $50 and $100, so the $75 is kind of um, an average or what seems to be typical. We also believe that it would cover the cost of administering the program. And then with Spencer's help, um, we have some additional analysis on the fiscal impact, so I'd like to turn it over to him. All right, I'll just briefly go through the slide here. Um, as you can see right now, our current um, revenue that we're receiving for the multifamily is about almost $112,000. And so that's our total revenue. Under our current system, our personnel cost is just over 112000 
leaving us a net loss of about $700, which is right about where you'd like to be. I mean, when you're trying to set up a fee structure to try to cover a program, you want to make sure that you're coming pretty close to covering your costs, but you certainly don't want to exceed your costs. And so our current program is working pretty well just how it is. If we look at the proposed program, then we'd be looking at about 149000 from multifamily revenue, about 60000 from single family revenue, with a total of about 209000 and then the personnel cost for this program, with the additions that Shannon's just discussed, would be about 211000 which would put us at a net loss of about 1700 which again is right in the ballpark about where you'd want to be with trying to match the revenues to the costs. And then uh, the last piece that we wanted to discuss, discuss before any questions that the board may have is just the timeline. Um, in order to adopt this in, so that we could budget for it for the next fiscal year, uh, we would anticipate if it were to be adopted, that would take place before April 30th of 2012. And then an estimated implementation date uh, would be January 1st, 2013. We're right now, um, within the last month, we've issued the renewals and the licensing for the multifamily program uh, because those have a deadline at the end of the month. So those are all, the cycle that we're on at this point is um, renewals for January 1st. Um, if we did go with a January 1st, 2013 implementation time frame, that would also allow for adequate um, research of putting our database together for all of the single family homes that we believe to be rental, the proper public notice and adoption period, and then of course hiring uh, and training the personnel that would be needed for the program expansion. And um, that's the presentation that we have, so uh, Spencer and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. We can put a copy of the presentation on our village website. I don't have a computer. I'm a dinosaur. I can get your contact information from Steve May and we can we can get that Shannon. to you. Shannon, you can give her this. <laughs> Shannon, you've got an approximate uh, 800 units for a single family. Right. How did we come up with that number? There was um, a methodology that was employed. Um, Spencer can probably speak to this a little bit further, but we looked at five different <laughs> sampling ways to determine how much housing stock we had that was single family residential. We used the American Community Survey and the census results. Um, we used our own water billing data and came up with five different numbers, and we took the, cri the uh, average of those five methodologies. Do you have anything to add? How many single family homes do we have in town now? Um, I have the number of multifamily units. I could get that for Monday. I'm not sure offhand of the total. I don't have a question, I have a comment for you. Um, first of all, I would not like to see the multifamily uh, fee go up in order to um, implement the program because the cost will necessarily go up. So if we're going to do it, I'd rather see it stay at 30 for multi and 75 or 85 for single family. Um, however, um, I'd be in favor of, and it's probably why you put it on there about um, adoption next spring, uh, tabling or postponing it until we get to budget talks because we certainly can't afford to do this if we can't afford additional inspectors. So um, that's my comment. I agree on the uh, fee structure. I'd even see it. we'd have to see what the difference is if we left it at the thirty dollars for multifamily. Right, we we could rerun those numbers. Just so we know what the additional would have to be to where the uh, single family homes Certainly. would have to be uh, charged. The multifamily, the multifamily licensing program went into effect uh, on January 1st, 2010. 
there were a series of public meetings that were held uh, throughout the latter part of 2009 um, to elicit public feedback and discussion at that time. But there was no voting for the, for the people to vote it, it was not a referendum matter, if that's what you're referring to. Yes. The village board, the trustees voted on it. Could we have these people come to the podium you so come we can up hear to them, the, please? Uh, podium, yes, please. Up the Good evening. Thank you for the moment. Uh, my name is Grace Snyder Kubica. I'm currently the president of the Westmont Landlords Association. But tonight I'm speaking for myself, as I haven't spoken to too many of the members. What I'm asking about is this single-family residence ordinance that you're thinking of putting together. Currently, the multifamily seems to be more of a safety issue. And if it's going to be a safety issue for the rental homes, uh, why isn't it being offered or why isn't it put on the rest of the residents of Westmont? Don't we want all of them to be safe? We They're do. They're being rented. I'm talking it's not about a business where a business is where it's a business if you rent your home. Beside the point, the homeowners don't they want don't we want them to be safe? Isn't that discrimination against them? No, ma'am. No. The court thought so in Iowa. At any rate, it seems as though this ordinance, the multifamily, seems to be leveled towards safety. And I noticed you said something about maintenance on here. And I don't really don't recall seeing that in the ordinance for the multifamily. It also occurs to me that with the multifamily licensing, it seems to be a hit or a miss, or a miss and a hit. The smaller, like I own one four flat. I'm being inspected for the second time in two years. Not that I had any major problems. And many other people that I know of with just one building are going back year after year, so it's two years in a row. But they haven't done Eagle Creek yet. And some of the other larger multifamily complexes. Eagle Creek is one that was a major headache to everyone in Westmont, especially the police department, I understand. I think we need to really revisit these ordinances and perhaps uh, be a little more careful about what we're doing because they're running willy-nilly we're not getting to the point. It's not working right. And that's what you guys are for, to make it work right. So how about if you get on it? I'd appreciate it. We all would appreciate it. Thank you very much. We're finding a lot in the, or in the inspections of unsafe balconies and unsafe conditions. So we are seeing that it's working. Well, in some instances that I know of, they were inspected and they passed. Huh? They should pass. That's what we'd like it to see is well, pass. Well, if they're inspected and they really shouldn't pass and they passed, something's wrong. And which instances are those, ma'am? Well, I have one building that I know of in particular, but I don't think I want to advertise it to the whole town. Well, I would be, I would be um, very pleased if you could privately do that so our staff, I'd be real interested to see that particular situation. Because Absolutely. if that is the case, then we do have a problem. Well, this but is by, but by, by making that statement in the public venue, I appreciate that. But if you could please give that information, it will be given to us. We'll be more than happy to look at it. And if that building was passed and it shouldn't have been passed, and you're correct, we have a problem. We also have Chad buildings. I live at 61st in Fairview. It was the Brookshire, uh, or Brook something. It was a large apartment complex that was built back in 1978. I bought the building in 2000, 2001. And it, it was broken up a long time ago. People were buying a building or two here and there. There's also Chad buildings in there, Chicago Housing Authority. And to my knowledge, they've not been inspected either. For a while, I believe the village didn't know if they could or should inspect them, but that should have been determined. And those buildings should be inspected as well. 
just for the record, Chad, I believe, is Community Housing Authority of DuPage Community. County. I'm it's sorry. Nothing to do with Chicago Housing Authority. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. Thank you for your time. And I will give you that information. Yes, please. I'll be back with you. Um, we appreciate the input that you have given us and has been asked if you have additional information that you can provide to the village and anonymously or however you so desire. We will, we will take those comments under advisement I appreciate that. because the total reason that we're doing this is to make Westmont a safer place for, for all of us. And, and the amount of time and effort uh, that staff and this village board has put into the multi-family ordinance has been has been tremendous. It's not perfect, and it does need refining. But we can't cut our staff short on what they've been attempting to do because it is a gigantic task, and they're working their way through it. But whatever corrections can be made, we're certainly willing to listen to those. So. Thank you for your comments. That would be good. Okay, Shannon, um, you didn't, I haven't seen the breakdown of what do you mean by safer? What, now I take it when you say single family, you're talking, um, the multifamily only included three units and more. So you're talking two units, you're talking duplex. Um, that would be something to be hashed out uh, during this discussion because you're right um, currently the ordinance is for buildings with three units or more so we do have a number of situations with duplexes and other styles of attached housing that have two units um, that would need to be considered um, as as the speaker was uh, mentioning some of her concerns a moment ago I thought of the I heard the Chad example and I believe they may have been omitted because they're actually it's a program where they're on a track to ownership um, so those units maybe right now don't qualify when they're owner occupied but for example they may become um, if the program is expanded that that would change what do you mean that they may be owned do you mean these people are put in as renters and they may buy with the Chad program I believe it's a established um, criteria that are met and then some of the the tenants ultimately become homeowners there so I had asked before what about our renters who are on a contract saying you know that they're renting with the option to buy mm -hmm. why would they not be having the same dignity as as the Chad again it's going to be up to the larger discussion on at what point the program parameters are set and what do you mean um, what are you looking at? You're going to go into a home. You call it, we're looking for safety. What are you looking at for these people to do? Because this is a single family, presumably not an attached. So what the heck are you looking for in this thing? What, are, what should these people expect in, a in an inspection? Well, there's a several page inspection package. Um, I believe it was provided to the board members in advance of the meeting this evening. Um, but I don't anticipate that if the program were to be expanded that that list would be much different. It all comes from our currently adopted codes. Mm -hmm. It's nothing um, that wouldn't be applicable anywhere else. So it's general property maintenance, um, you know, like is there any rubbish in the rear yard? Um, are the screens in good working condition or do they have holes in them? Um, okay. General uh, screens. Who cares if they have holes? Why, why is that a safety issue? Well, it's part of the adopted, the currently adopted village ordinance um, pertaining to property maintenance. So um, there, the codes that are used are uh, code council books, which are adopted either in full or in part or amended. And that is a code, um, weather, weatherization and protection from pests or insects is one of the reasons. So that's, um, Ron, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but property maintenance codes have been adopted and used by the village well in advance of the licensing program. So are you going to go back and make a house that's a rental that was built in the 1940s? 
be up to date on codes Pat, no. for the 2010. No, Pat, that's not the purpose we're, of this. We're back at this discussion and you're going to bring up the whole grandfathering of the, I don't think that you ought to go after Shannon for this because the board is going to set the parameters. And Shannon I'm and, just trying to get an answer. She doesn't know yet because we haven't set those parameters. Mm -hmm. And I think to sit here and, and ask her, you know, what are you going to do about this? What are you gonna, those parameters haven't been set yet. So it's unfair to sit there and grill her about what are you going to do about this and what are you going to do about I'm sorry, that. I thought I heard her she talk isn't going to answer codes. that. I thought she just talked about being up to the codes, and that's why I'm questioning it. Well, we have she general, literally said, "Bring them up to the codes." No, no, no. We have general maintenance property codes that are on the books right now. Not bring it up to code. It took us almost a year to come up with the wording for the multifamily housing and there was a lot of discussion on how that went into place mm -hmm. it's going to take every bit of that again back and forth there's going to be stuff thrown out there's going to be stuff added in there's going to be discussions on what is right what's wrong there's going to be legal issues i'm sure dealing with this i mean there's there's a lot of ground to cover before we even get to exactly the specifics mm -hmm. on this this is just I think starting starting point to where we can start discussing it but we have actual property maintenance codes in effect now and that is in there it's no different than what's on the multifamily. multifamily so whatever apartment building owner has an issue with his building and has to have it fixed this is exactly what I would have to have done if it was passed for a single family rental home which is a business to the person who owns it if this does not get put on the budget, this has to be done when we're home rule, correct? We were not able to do the multifamily before because we were not home rule. Well, we, we are home rule, rule though. Home. We are home well, rule. Well, for now, right. we're home rule. Right. I'm saying is the push to get this on then because we're still home rule. If we wait no, I for think the end of the I, budget I, year, we were, the staff was asked to bring this up mostly because of what's been occurring in the housing market with the foreclosures and the concern mm -hmm. about the number of homes that are being rented and the impact that that's having on the community. Uh, that's why we brought it up. Well, I, I had it questioned whether it was being pushed from resident because well, uh, we, no. we actually, we I actually we talked about this. We brought this up before the census. Well, it's yeah. been talked about. No, but we, we, about. Talk, we talked about this uh, when uh, Mr. Kimball was still here, approximately a year after we had gone into it. I know that Trustee Scott, as well as myself, on several occasions said, you know, we'd really like to start, start generating this mm -hmm. and start talking about this. I, Home rule or not, I, that hasn't even entered into my mind. When we started deal. talking about multifamily, a number of the trustees said, and after we get done with that, we're going to be looking at single family rentals. Right. It's always been hanging out there. And we started just, it with multifamily, get it working, and then work our way towards single family. Right. And, and at that time, we had more people in the building department. We don't have them, we don't have staff. Yeah, we want safe homes for people to rent. That's what we want in this community. We want to attract a good resident to come to this town, to use our schools, to go to the schools, to use our businesses. And if these aren't buildings that are kept up to attract a good quality resident, we're going to have the opposite. And the more rentals you end up having, I'm sorry, in a community, that you have a, a temptation for that to happen. And we don't want our community to go south. We want our schools to be good. We want it a, a viable community so people want to move here. And that's what we want is a safe place to rent. And that's what this is all about. This has nothing to do with anything else except for to bring a good family that wants right. to be here so involved in our community, voting in our community, house. going to churches in our community, well, all of what's it. What's a safe house? A safe house would be a proper operating furnace mm -hmm. that is not causing carbon dioxide to back up in the house, maintaining it to see to it that it operates in a proper fashion, seeing to it that the, that the, if it's gas, that it ignites the proper way. 
It's electric. Well, then it should have to go to. I mean, it's if they it's, rent a building, you know, or rent, rent a house, or rent an apartment, and it's in bad shape, where the electric isn't working well, or it's not safe, or like Lee's saying, where the uh, heating's an issue, where do they have to go? Don't they expect? us to be doing that to make sure that these buildings are in good condition so they can rent a safe place or is it going to be buyer beware? I guess I would go to my landlord and if he didn't fix it I would move on to another house. If it, It's uh, easier to say than uh, to do than say because if you got kids in school you just can't be pulling them out all the time. Well, there has to be some kind if, of agency safe, that looks over it and takes care of it. Okay so you're talking furnace. Maybe you're talking air conditioner. That's what I'm trying to find out. Screens are BS. Well we've already got it Screens in the books. Are BS. Screens are already on the books. Yeah, so, and they, they, you know, it, it doesn't else. matter whether they are or not. Whether yes, they but have this is all things to discuss. This I'm isn't gonna, the night tonight to discuss it, but right. it'll be discussed but in the future. I'm going to read. Smoke detectors and work, work in CO, I can see. Handrails, I can see. This is what I'm looking to hear. Paint, I really don't care. But this is all this is all is, part of what is, we're going to talk about. Right, we we assume this was a broader policy discussion. Right. This but evening. that's why I was thinking when she brought this up that it's ready for discussion. I thought that's what we're well, doing is discussing. Uh, oh. This is the preliminary to get it started. But it, it's so I'm starting thing. it. And I so think right? this is I'm starting be, it. Okay. I think this is this is something that should be in, just like we do with multifamily. We we um, hash out a lot of details. In committee, and then we we talk about them um, at committee of the whole, so that we are not going through each and every little tiny item, and all the other items on the agenda. We're going to be here till midnight. Okay, I Pat, just, I appreciate that you want to start it. Preparation discussion, the discussion on preparation. I understand that, and which is why I'm going to re-raise my suggestion that we don't have the money and don't even know if we're going to have the money till we start talking about the budget. So I don't want to start talking about what elements of the code the inspectors are going to be looking at until we even know whether it's viable, which is next spring when we start budget okay, workshops. When we're talking about inspectors now, do they not have to be certified to a certain degree? As part of the multifamily program, we had ensured that the inspectors were certified. Would that be carried through? Do we have to have the same type of inspector? Again, it would be a policy decision. Um, that would be a certain... doesn't require it then is what you're saying? No, I don't believe so. Okay. So, so that's something you might want to put into your budget. Right. If, if they're, because if they've gone through a training, they may have to expect to be paid a little more. If they haven't gone through a training, do they expect us to pay? Things like that. Right. Okay. I appreciate yeah, it. We're, we're hoping to get some direction in terms of preparation for the budget process. Okay. We understand, you know, that it's going to have to go through and be approved in the budget. We're missing two trustees, but I can tell you that I'm not going to impose an uncertified inspector on anybody. Um, they're going to have the right credentials. That's why we need them certified, so they know what they're looking for. It's, this isn't a two-week class, and we turn them loose. Well, there should be no difference between multifamily and single family. Correct. Are they, um, in we, we can define the parameters. Are doing some of the inspecting yeah. now? I heard at one point when we uh, hired uh, the engineering firms, some of their inspectors were going to be helping. Well, um, maybe you're referring to Don Morris Architects, our plan review and building inspection firm. Right. Um, they don't do engineering services for us, but they do provide building permit plan review and building inspections. And then they're like a backup to us when we have more inspections than we have available staff. Um, there was a, a budget line item for us to be able to use their services. Okay, but I mean, you're talking, when you say inspections, you're talking about they're, they're helping out with the multifamily, not building instructions. They do all of our building inspections, and then separate from that, they do um, a, a small portion of our multifamily inspections, generally they, as backup. Are they uh, certified like yes. ours? So yes. we do have them. Yes. So you have a fee then to kind of get a, a feeling of what this is costing is what then probably you have. Uh, we have their per inspection fee, correct. Okay. Because I'm just curious too then since they're outsourcing um, instead of hiring if it's going to cost us benefits then it might be better to continue what it would cost if we were going to try to take this on and continue outsourcing as long as they have the certification. I think they can uh, guesstimate those numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are taking that into consideration, trying to find the best mix of utilizing the outsourcing as well as 
internal employees to try to find the most cost-effective method. Yep. All right. These are these are things that we've talked about in trying to prepare for this discussion. We're, you know, again trying to get some direction as we move into the budget preparation process. Do we want to continue to try to build numbers into the budget? This is something the board is going to want to set as a policy. And mm -hmm. um, you know, there admittedly is still a lot of details to work out. Mm -hmm. Do you have sufficient information from the discussion up to this point to move ahead? We've got a lot of other agenda items the cover this evening and our item this evening says discuss preparation of an ordinance obviously we're not going to refine everything but we have raised enough questions for staff I believe to go ahead and look further into this and answer some of the questions well, that have already been raised I think at, at one point during the multifamily also we actually had some special meetings yes. right scheduled exactly where, you know the public was brought in too so yeah, I was just going to ask if we're going to have the public brought in. Sure, sure. Let's, we will. let's not put the cart before the horse. Is there anything else you need from us then for tonight? Uh, I guess just some direction if we should proceed. Shall we? Shall we pull the ordinance discussion off the table for now? No, proceed with. Wait, just a minute. Proceed with putting numbers in the budget for the board to discuss in yeah. terms of staffing versus contract mix, and then you know based on how the budget. Is decided that'll give us some policy direction as far as the ordinances. I'd like to see it. Yep. Okay. and I live in Westmont, and I have a, a little rental house that was built by Sears, and it's 83 years old. Now, if an inspector comes in, I do have a new furnace, and it's up to date, but supposing the inspector owns a heating and air conditioning store, would he, you know, look at, I being dishonest, would he look at my furnace and say, you need a new furnace, and I'd have to do it because if he's looking furnace, for business? If the furnace that's currently in the house is operating appropriately, there would be no question whether it's 10 or 20 years old, as long as it is working the way that it's supposed to be working. Okay. They're not out there to cause any undue hardships on owners. And the other thing is, too, an 83-year-old house has issues. And I, I'm a very good landlady. I keep up with everything. And I get tenants in there, and they move out without paying their rent, and they trash it. And I have to start all over again. And this goes on and on. Now, does this benefit me anyway if I have inspectors coming in to uh, inspect the uh, premises. Hopefully would it, in the long would it, uh, would the it big help? scheme of things, it would bring a better quality tenant into you so you wouldn't have as many problems. We check them out very carefully, and we give them a little gift basket and a Christmas basket, and they just... Maybe you should wait for the gift until they leave. <laughs> 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 yes. But but I, I know, I know what you're talking about, and it's, it's very it's difficult. It's just, and it costs a couple thousand dollars to get it back in shape again. My husband said the family had rental things, and, and I, when he wanted to get into it, I refused. <laughs> I want nothing to do with rentals. I won't live in one, and I won't want Well, we one. would like to sell it, but, but the, you know, the times are not good right now. But, but that, that's, that's why I said I want to see how things are going, because I worry about these older homes. Mm -hmm. and, and the people who may have to sell it and would like to hold off another year or two and may turn into rental. I have no idea how many homes they think they're going to inspect in a year. You might pay, if it's 100 homes and there's 800, I'm saying they're going to, these people are going to be paying eight years before they finally have one inspection. I have a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, it, it's apple and oranges. When it comes to a 
multifamily where you have several people in the same building, you have to make sure because one family can screw them, something up and everybody gets penalized in that. When you have a single family, that's between you and the landlord, and I have heard tons of time over here when people have trouble with something, they keep yelling, this is a civil issue, it's a civil issue, and I think we're butting into a chance where it is a civil issue, but if that's what the other fellow trustees want to get into, that's, that's going to be their problem. But thank, um, thank I do have concerns. Thank you for your comments. I think we need to, thank you need to for, move along. Thank you for listening. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming to the podium. Thank you. <laughs> New business. 2011 Tax Levy Board to conduct a public hearing and consider an ordinance to adopt the proposed 2011 Tax Levy Ordinance. All right, this is an issue that has come before the board several times this year in preparation for this tax levy. Um, as you're all aware, what we do is we set up a proposed levy and then we publicize that and allow the public opportunity to comment. Um, this year, the official public hearing will be on Monday. And this year, because of the small increase which we have, we are not legally required to publish it in the paper and have the public hearing. However, because we've done that this previously, we wanted to have a continuing opportunity for our residents. We have continued to do that and are providing them an opportunity to comment. Um, just to briefly go over what's in the proposed levy, um, we are looking at keeping the, all the operating revenues for the village as well as the library pretty static from the prior year and the increase that would be in the levy would be for the police pension. As the board's well aware, the police pension has had some issues with being fully funded, and a number of years ago, the board decided that the best thing to do would be to try to fully fund the annual required contribution each year. And that's all that this is doing, is simply funding that to the level which the board has indicated they would like to do to provide for you know, a sound financial footing for this police pension fund. I don't know if there's any additional questions right now. Spencer, didn't they push the date out again? They did, yes. We are now required to be 90% funded by the year 2040. Um, and by the year 2016, we're going to be required to make the full annual required contribution. And if we're not, the state can begin withholding funds that they would pay to us and instead give it to the pension. So right now, what percentage of funding are we actually doing? Right. Got right here. So first of all, I will show the total percentage funded. Let's see if I can get this up on the screen. All right, so you can kind of see over the past several years, you know, we started back in the fiscal year of 98, 99, it being 82% funded, total overall in the fund. And you see it kind of dropped and dropped and dropped, and then it had began climbing again, and then it had a big drop again in fiscal year 2008-2009. And in the last year for which the actuaries performed the analysis, we came up a little bit, and we're now at 45.3% funded. And the reason that we were able to begin to start coming back is <coughs> this graph here, which shows the annual required contribution compared to the actual contribution. You can see kind of in the early years, that the blue line, which is the annual required contribution, was significantly higher than the actual contribution that was made. And because of that, the annual required contribution kept going up and up and up. And then you'll notice when the board made the decision to fund at the rate of the annual required contribution, or as close as we can guess at the time we do the property tax levy, then we jumped up to be much closer. You can see at that point we were at 90%. Now we're at 98.6, and then we're hoping to be at 100% funded for the annual contribution. And if we continue to make the annual contribution, then in theory we'll be able to get fully funded. But currently we're only about 45% funded. And as you push off making the contribution, of we, as we've seen from previous years, if you don't make the full contribution, the next year gets higher and higher and higher. And so the board had decided they wanted to try to stop that from happening, make the full contribution, and then have the contribution kind of level out. Spencer, forgive me, but I thought um, I thought we had decided to fund it at 105% to make up all of the um, shortcomings and to make sure that we were 
fully funded every year and then also um, building up where we were short. The, my understanding is that we had decided we were going to be funding 105% of the prior year's annual required contribution because when we come time to the, make this property tax levy at this point, we don't know what the required contribution will be for next year. So our best guess is to do 105% of last year's. And we hope that that either gets to the annual required contribution or, you know, in a best case scenario, <coughs> even exceeds it. And then we've also been <coughs> trying to subsidize that a little bit with some supplemental sales tax when that's been available. It's, trying, it's kind of like trying to hit a moving target. And we've, <laughs> you know, we tried, the board decided to go with 105% to try to um, uh, bridge that gap that, that uh, began a few years ago, but we don't never know until like a, a year in arrears. Um, in our packet, the, the funding part, uh, it says to be raised by the tax levy. These are items you've expected to raise up in price. I'm looking at the ambulance paramedics. That's about a million and a half more in there and stuff. Is is this, uh, or just am I just not understanding this? You're, you're talking about the ordinance piece of it then? Yeah, yeah, the one that has all the numbers on it here. Yes, so we are looking at putting in about a million and a half towards the ambulance. Yes, because for the ambulance property tax levy. A million and a half more. A million and a half I'm total. Sorry. How much being? Yeah, that, that, well, the, the amount yeah. that's in the ordinance is the amount that we're levying. Yes. So it's the amount we'll be getting in this year that we're levying or requesting in this year. Right, that was the tax that the, was created by referendum years, right. years ago. Right. I was and just so wondering because of the... So um, it's, it's the very same for ambulance as it was the prior year. So the 2010 extension was for 1.5 million. Our proposed levy is also for 1.5 million. Okay, okay. So we, the 1.5 million is the total. Going operating. Not an increase. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Any other questions? <clears throat> Thank you. The official public hearing on this is scheduled for Monday. However, if there's anyone here this evening that would like to speak on this issue, uh, you're more than welcome to... Uh, do that at this time. Hmm. Thank you. Next item, natural gas use tax. Board to consider ordinances regarding the natural gas use tax as follows. A, approving a gas use tax collection agreement with NICOR Gas Company, and B, amending Chapter 74, Article 6 of the Westmont Code of Ordinances regarding the natural gas use tax. Speaking of uh, hitting a moving target, um, <laughs> we um, have talked about this in our committee meetings as a, um, an effort to try to uh, respond to some uh, drops in revenue that we saw a couple of years ago. This is identified by our uh, utility auditor as, as, you know, the term has been used as a loophole for some people to avoid paying um, tax on, on natural gas utility. Um, so we have this recommended ordinance that actually the board approved back in October. 17th. October 17th. And with our consultant, we've been working with um, NICOR to try to uh, come up with a collection agreement. And we've been going back and forth on that. And now we've also uh, been notified by NARCOR that they would like to see some changes in the ordinance. And I know the village attorney has passed out a revised copy of that ordinance this evening for you to look at. And it is our um, um, uh, desire to um, submit this again to NICOR um, and maybe have some kind of response on Monday in terms of are these further changes to the ordinance acceptable? Is this agreement acceptable? Can we move forward? We were originally hoping, hoping to uh, have this uh, collection begin January 1st, but because of some of these um, um, language issues, uh, we're now looking at a February 1st um, collection date to begin with. It appears that NICOR um, 
is not in the habit of actually negotiating a contract but demanding terms. Um, and, unfortunately, and how our ordinance is written. And, and demanding exactly the wording of our ordinance. Um, if you look at the ordinance, which is the second thing in the packet that I handed out to you, mm -hmm. um, you'll notice basically um, the information is the same. Um, for example, they wanted to call it a municipal gas use tax as opposed to a natural gas use tax because when we draft our ordinances for the village, uh, we are the municipality, so to call it a municipal <coughs> gas use doesn't really say anything to us since we differentiate between natural gas and gasoline tax. Um, so there's very minor changes. Um, the um, cost per therm obviously remains the same. The cost for NICOR to collect the, the funds from the users remains the same. Um, they are just requiring certain, certain words. Uh, for example, we indicated that the village was authorized to enter into the contract and they want specifically to enumerate the mayor, the village treasurer, the village manager, and the village finance director are each authorized to enter into the contract. Uh, very minute details, but they will not sign the collection agreement which will allow them to collect the tax until our ordinance is drafted the way they want it. Um, and that's what we have here tonight. Um, and um, as a result of their demands, instead of being able to collect the tax January 1st, as we had initially <coughs> adopted in October, uh, we have to move it back to February 1st start date um, so that they, NICOR, can get um, through their review process and get it started for collection. And this was for all the, the companies that were out of state? Exactly. Well, what kind of contract do we have for them for here in the state? We, Is there any contract with them for? We don't, we don't they don't require a contract okay, okay. in state. Okay. It's one of those, that's where people were getting out of, out of state gas, were paying no tax whatsoever, but those that were in state were paying the tax. Yeah. Right. So you've got an inequity on the, on the tax on the, on the actual gas itself, natural gas. That's why this came about. I just didn't know if we had a contract with them if they needed one originally or not, if there had been any difference between the two. Um, it, it does say under remittance about um, the contractor will remit the tax collected net of its fee. Are we kind of aware on, I'm presuming they mean they're going to charge? They charge 3%. 3%. 3 is it? Okay. That's it. So they get a fee? for collecting the tax for us. Yes, and remitting it to us, yes. So they get, so the people who are paying the taxes will have to pay tax for us plus another 3%? No. How much is the no, gas the company getting out of this is what well, I'm. The, the, people who, the people who this is going to entail are those who have not been paying any tax at I all. understand that. Okay. And they're gonna start paying taxes. Right. And we're gonna get the tax. Right. But are they also, I'm presuming, going to be hit with the way it reads here and that its fee sounds to me that the gas company is going to um, get a fee, take money, because they're collecting for us? They're going to, they're going to take yeah. a portion of what we would get. That, that, and that's what I'm asking. Uh, uh, yeah, they're going to take okay. a portion of what we would get in as consideration okay. for the effort of collecting. I thought I remembered that. something on that, but I couldn't remember how much it was, if it Three percent. Right? That was a three percent of what they're collecting from For our us. portion. Right. 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 Thank you. Any other questions? So basically, this is being passed to close a, a loophole. Those businesses, those who have not paid exactly this tax. Prior, as all of us know as residents, we are paying that tax currently in most of the village. So I don't know what the what are the percentages, what are the numbers of additional generators of this revenue, of businesses or whatever, that are going to be paying this. 
Do well, we have any idea? Because of the deregulation, my understanding is that where they obtain that gas, <clears throat> whether it's an in-state or out-of-state entity that's providing that gas. Okay. If okay. your provider, if you chose a provider that is an in-state supplier, you're already paying that tax. If you chose a provider that um, gets their natural gas from out of state, you're not paying that tax okay. at this point. Mm -hmm. We don't know what the revenue is so going to be yeah. until they until they start uh, collecting it, and hopefully they won't generate a problem like ComEd did, requiring a massive audit. Okay. We'll keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> Any other questions? Next item. Contract for tax increment financing, TIF, Consulting Services, ESCA Associates Incorporated. Board to consider an ordinance approving a contract for consulting services with the firm of Tesca Associates to create a tax increment financing district that will include the downtown Westmont business district. Good evening again tonight. We are fortunate to have Mike Hoffman, Vice President of Tesco, with us, with us um, to go over the uh, draft scope of services and contract uh, that was provided in your packets this evening in reference to the possibility of whether the board may like to create a TIF district in the downtown central business district. Um, just for those that are watching at home, this is the uh, area of Cass Avenue generally between Dallas and Naperville Road to the north. Um, Tesca is the consultant that was appointed the lead on our project for the Southwest Mont Business District and um, we requested the numbers uh, within the last month I would say and were provided with the, the two phases. Um, the first phase which would be the portion that we're at in the uh, other proposed district um, would be phase one eligibility. So there would be an analysis of all of the existing parcels to determine whether or not we would meet the criteria for even establishing a district. That phase one would cost $18,000 by contract. Um, if the eligibility were met, then the next phase would be the redevelopment plan and then formal designation. Um, so if it's not eligible, it wouldn't go any further than that initial amount. But if phase two were authorized, that portion would cost $29,500. Um, this portion of the village, the area that would be under study is much, many more parcels than what we were looking at in the South Westmont Business District. And then of course we have the unique factor of the uh, housing stock that would be within that district. So there's a housing impact study that would be necessary and many more meetings and other um, things that would come about as a result of this. So um, what I would like to do is see if the board has any questions and then um, between Mr. Hoffman and myself we can try to address those. The only thing that I can say so far, what I've seen in some of the preliminary stuff for the comprehensive plan, that one of the biggest things that is coming forward is the downtown district. Feedback you're getting from feedback the is is the downtown district. Yep. So I mean, I I don't see how we can't not do this. I mean, I. You know, if we got to give up, we gotta give up a single family, whatever licensing, that's fine. But I mean, if you know, if you know, uh, the South Business District met easily met eight of the thirteen criteria, my guess is downtown will be around twelve. Yeah, ten to twelve. Um, and the old uh, got to spend money to make money. This is going to be money well spent. Extremely well spent. Speaking of money, I should add that uh, we did put on, staff put on our boxing gloves and tried to do some negotiations. So for the benefit of Tesca, I did want to say that they granted us um, a $2,500 reduction in the amount that would ordinarily be due uh, because we went straight to them with uh, the request for the contract number. That's all? <laughs> actually, actually, it was a lot less than that in the beginning when we started talking about if we did two districts instead of just one. Right. <laughs> it was about $12,000. Yes, with the goal to uh, make downtown a destination. Yes. Well, thanks for the discount. Yes. <laughs> so. 
Um, just want to ask how is this, um, when would we expect the money due? Would we have it in the budget? We would be, again, be putting it in the draft budget. Yeah. And based on everything we're hearing from the board, it'll be a priority. Okay, but I'm just saying um, if we start before the new budget year, do you have something to get them started or would this wait until we May? We talked about that. Um, we did talk about it. Um, my conversation with Con Savoy was that our timing is such that they could probably work with us on the billing because we'd be something like six weeks out from you know, where that start of the fiscal year would be anyway. Now we're also managing the very large other projects including the comprehensive plan and the Southwest Mont Business District so <coughs> this would give us a little bit of time um, to, to get those further into the, the queue. Okay, so we don't have to look too deep or anything into this budget year then? Okay, good, thank you. Okay, anything further? Nope. Yahoo. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> Next item, United Meters Incorporated. Professional Services Agreement. Board to consider an ordinance <coughs> an agreement with United Meters Incorporated to perform certain water meter replacement services on the behalf of the village. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I will, uh, unless you're interested in a review, I'll, I'll, we, we've had, over the last year, we've had discussions about the village-wide meter replacement program. In this current fiscal year, we have uh, funds afforded to uh, replace 1,000 meters. We have already purchased the meters and we have them in stock. This agreement is for United Meters to do the installation in mass in the residential properties. There was 1,000 meters to be replaced and this contract um, will allow them to start right away with the replacement. We will right away in January and that kind of coincides with the, uh, the rate changes that we had too. So the good part is, is that they'll be able to knock off all 1,000 meters in within the same one two month billing cycle. So that's a, a great asset. So this is just for the, the labor. We've already purchased the meters. I think I just mentioned that. You're gonna get rid of all the phone meters, right? Yeah, these are the, these are radio read drive by. Yeah. Are they all for uh, single family homes or, that, or is that commercial? Is uh, also, these are not commercial. These are for the single-family homes. Okay. Hmm. Of different size. I mean, there's, in general, yes. I mean, there's a, there's a few odd ones in there, but we're typically doing the commercial ones, or the commercial ones are done. If you recall, the we did a village-wide meter replacement. I I don't remember the year, but they are all come to the same age at the same time is why we were doing these meter replacements in mass right now. The commercial ones and the bigger ones are unique, they're uniquely sized, they're specifically sized for the, for the use and those are, you know, replaced very uniformly across any one year. This is a special project. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Steve. Next item, Chicago Communications. LLC service agreement for to consider an ordinance authorizing an amended service agreement for public safety radio equipment with Chicago Communication LLC. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we uh, currently have a service agreement with Chicago Communications to conduct service um, on our um, previous communication center. We have four positions and computers in there. With the uh, changes of, uh, we're going to be moving the emergency communication center from fire headquarters into that previous communication center. Um, we want to continue the service and agreements um, with Chicago Communications to provide service for the uh, equipment that was previously there that will be operated by the Westmont Fire Department, uh, EMA, Emergency Management Agency, Westmont Street Department, and the Police Department. And so that's part of this agreement. The other part is, is that our repeater system for our radio network, um, we have been paying time and maintenance um, because at the time, Oak Brook and Hinsdale were partners with us. Uh, Hinsdale has left, have left, uh, have le has left us and gone to a uh, different vendor. And come uh, May, Oak Brook also, uh, we're hearing, is gonna be leaving the system as well, so we'll be on our own. 
So what we would like to do, and we are currently experiencing some service problems, so rather than paying time and maintenance, Chicago Commons said that they will um, compensate us for the time and maintenance that they performed if we go into this service agreement. Uh, so it's a cost savings to the village. Um, just recently today, um, there's a possibility that we may be changing radio systems with Downers Grove. We're looking that may affect this. So we would not execute this until we um, uh, flush everything out by the end of next week. But we're asking for the board's permission to um, enter into this agreement should it be um, moving forward. We definitely need the radio room equipment. It's the repeater equipment that may change. Okay. Questions? Hearing no questions, thank you, Tom. Next item, Civic Plus website service contract. Or to consider an ordinance approving a service services contract agreement with Civic Plus for website design and hosting service services at a cost of eleven thousand one hundred and seventy one dollars a year for the first three years and four thousand nine hundred and forty seven dollars a year starting with year four. Glenn. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this idea came out of the finance or administration and finance committee that happened in November. The board showed a pretty strong interest in improving uh, our website uh, to be able to take advantage of current social networking uh, abilities, uh, add additional functions, uh, a integrated uh, um, calendar that you can uh, subscribe to, um, along with a, a bunch of other uh, services uh, that we are looking at. Um, we were going to look at budgeting this into next fiscal year uh, in May 1. Uh, and when we looked at it and talking with the board, uh, from when we start the contract, it's about six months prior to going live with the site. So we would be looking at going up near the end of next year. So now when we were, we were at the end of uh, the company's fiscal year, we posed a question to the hosting company if they would delay payment but start the project now, which would then allow us to come live uh, right around uh, June of next year instead of the end of next year. Um, and due to incentives uh, for them to have a contract signed by the end of the calendar year, uh, they actually agreed to it. Um, the other advantage to this, normally when you sign the agreement, um, the first year the hosting is included because half of uh, the year is gone by the time the site goes live. Um, with the delayed billing, and it's not really a delayed billing, they're gonna start the contract May 1 and give us this entire time between when the contract is signed to May 1 uh, for the development. So we'll actually get a full year of hosting. So in a way you're getting about four, four and a half months uh, at no cost uh, during that design process. So you'll get almost a full year of the hosting where before you would lose that out during the design process. Um, we looked at the three-year agreement because um, it spreads the money out. It's not as large of a hit on the budget, um, and it would allow us to uh, get into the site as well. Uh, plus, the, the, the cost savings, there isn't much of a cost savings there because um, in the contract, the original uh, initial buyout, if we were to pay for it the first year, is $24,088, and then your, your monthly hosting would be the $4,900 after that. So uh, with the three months uh, signed up front, spreading it out, it, it makes a lot of sense to do it that way. So um, this is strictly an option to the board. If you want to take advantage of that, um, it would be a commitment on the board to make sure that the funding is in place uh, during the budgeting process. And Anne-Marie, I think uh, you pointed out that this is uh, a little odd because it does uh, is a three-year contract that the board does have to commit to. So I'm, I don't know if you want to mention the, the the issues around that. Right. Generally, um, a municipal board can only contract for the budget term that they have um, authorized. Um, and a, in a situation where we're talking about getting discounts um, over a three-year period for a larger project, um, we can um, discuss those types of issues and agree to do that sort of thing um, based upon the, the home rule. Mm -hmm. that we, we do carry at this point. Right. Um, so if anybody has any questions about that. What do other communities do then? What do other, pardon me? Other communities, what do they do? Or they have that same issue where they can only budget for or do a contract for one year? Yes, yes. 
So then why are they, at, is it a three-year instead of a... Non-home rule communities. Non-home rule communities okay. are the ones that can only do it for okay. the appropriation or budget year okay. that they've appropriated yeah. for. Trustee Nero had a strong interest in this project, as I think a lot of the board members know. He um, had hoped to be here tonight. He had a business appointment that um, kept him away, and he sent me an email a couple hours before the meeting, and he just wanted to express, again, his support, which I know he's expressed at the committee discussions that we've had for this. Mm -hmm. One of the other positives about this as well, if the board does decide to go to electronic packets, um, they do have a fully integrated electronic uh, uh, agenda prep application that's part of the same cost. So um, there's a complete list in the contract uh, of all of the different um, services or modules that come with uh, the software. So. so it would actually be built in to take into account this electronic packet Correct. system. Correct. And it wouldn't be something that we'd have to go figure out after the fact. Correct. I think the school board's around $2,500, $2,800 a year for, for their additional system. And we could still use the agenda prep portion of it and just not do the electronic side. If we, you know, we, it could be posted to the website, the board just, you know, could decide later if they want to take advantage of that. But the gathering and everything, if I understand the electronic side, especially with whatever would be a lot less time consuming on staff. For the agenda prep, yes. Yeah, yeah that's where your savings will be. Is on staff time. Yes. Correct? Yes. Streamline. Correct. Streamline it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Plus, it's a, it's a straight posting to the website, too, so everything's automated. You know, you have uh, agendas are posted. They automatically get placed on. Um, you People can then uh, subscribe to that and be notified when those agendas get posted, you know, when something changes in those agenda items. And we're reaching out to a large portion of the population. Correct. And, and every, every section of the site can be integrated with uh, Twitter, Facebook, Google+. Um, it's a completely up-to-date site. Um, Civic Plus has been around for a while. They have over 60 communities in Illinois uh, right now and, and, and hundreds of them across the country. Uh, Elmhurst is one that uses it locally. Oprah is just about to launch their new site on Civic Plus. Uh, we've been watching numerous companies over the last five years. Uh, as we do with anything we contract for to see if anything is out there. And Civic Plus is by far the one that has provided the, the forward momentum of new options and improved options that other companies have not. So, Does any, any of the board members object to this item and moving forward as requested? Mm -hmm. okay. I, think we need, I think we need to step up. Yep. It's going to get a. It's going to. It's going to reach a audience that probably right now we're not reaching. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Glenn. I got the go next too one far. too. Yeah. He's got the next one. <laughs> <laughs> next item: Alpay Media Group video support contract board to consider an ordinance approving a contract agreement with Alpay Media Group to perform video support services for the. Inf information Technology Department. Um, this is a standard contract that we've had with other contractors. Um, we are uh, doing something a little bit different than before where we contracted with an individual uh, to do uh, the meetings. We are now contracting with a company to do the meetings, which uh, with it brings uh, the, the full liability insurance that comes with the contractor plus multiple people who are uh, trained to provide the services, not just one person. Um, Additionally, this is a Westmont business. It's also a downtown Westmont mm -hmm. business, too, yes. Oh, cool. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks. Moving right along. Finance ordinance number 16. Waive the reading. Request to waive the reading. Purchase orders. Questions on purchase orders? Nope. Uh, hearing no questions on purchase orders. Unless there's something else to uh, come before the board at this time or discussion, I would entertain a motion to go into executive session as requested regarding personnel and pending litigation. So moved, Emery. Second, Scott. Roll call. Trustee Emery. Yes. Trustee Clevenel. Yes. Trustee Scott. Yes. Trustee Fleming. Yes. 
Okay. Thank you. We are adjourned to executive session. What's